Uh, my name is Jörg Haas. I am heading the Department of International Politics at the Heinrich Böll Foundation. And it's an extreme pleasure to welcome all of you in this important debate on carbon pricing. Um, we have among us uh, three of the most interesting um, exponents of a really important debate that we really need to get right. What is the role of carbon pricing in climate politics? What are the prospects? And before I hand over to our moderator who will present uh, the panelists, let me just <clears throat> indicate to you that this is a discussion which will be held in English, but which is simultaneously translated into German. So if you want to uh, hear German, just click on the bottom right on a button with a globe. Wenn Sie Deutsch hören möchten, klicken Sie rechts unten auf den Dolmetschen uh, Knopf in Zoom und dann hören Sie die deutsche Übersetzung oder können Sie dann das auswählen. So it's an extreme pleasure to welcome um, Ottmar Edenhofer, David Victor and Danny Kallenwart. Um, I don't say much more than I'm just absolutely pleased uh, several of my heroes in the international climate debates are this evening with us and I'm really looking forward to this debate. I'm handing over to Petra Pinsler, a very prominent journalist uh, from Die Zeit who is also covering climate issues since many, many years and also an, a very good expert on this issue. So Petra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jörg, and hi to everybody. I'm really looking forward to the debate that we will be having in a moment, because as, as Jörg actually said, we do have three of the most prominent e climate economists um, worldwide in this debate, but they're not just prominent, they're on two very opposite sides. And I think it will be quite easy to get them to debate because two of them are rather critical when it comes to a CO2 price and one is defending it. The two that are very critical, first of the, the first one of them is Danny Cullenward. He's a forensic climate economist. I um, didn't ask him what forensic means. I know what climate economists are. Forensic, he still has to explain to me. Uh, he works, he, he's an economist and a lawyer, um, and he works for Carbon Plan and the Stanford Law, Law School. And he wrote a book together with David Victor, who is an economist and professor at the University in San Diego. And they are actually advocating or arguing that the CO2 price um, has some downsides, but I will not go into it because they will do it in, 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 in just a minute. After I have presented to you, Ottmar Edenhofer, who is probably well known to all of you, he's um, heading the Potsdamer Institute for Climate Impact Research, the PIC here in Germany, and he is rather one of the, the godfathers of the CO2 price. So let me, before I hand over to um, Danny Cullenward and David Victor, the, the rules of the game. They both will have, um, both, both, par both, par both parties will have about 10 minutes to explain their points. We think this is important in, in this kind of debate that they have the time to really explain this rather difficult issue and their opinion on, on this rather, good, rather difficult issue. And after that, I will debate with them and you will already have the possibility to communicate with others in the chat. You will have the possibility, what, what you can do right away to write in some questions. I will try to put them and use them from, from my, for when, I, when I moderate um, the, the Q&A. And that's about it. That's about it. So I am looking forward to uh, the first, um, yeah, to, to David and, 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 and to Victor. I know what they're writing, but I'm really keen to listen to you and to to hear you arguing that point of view. Excellent. Going. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Petra. Thank you, Jörg. Thank you to the Henrik Bill Stiftung for hosting this. I mean, this is, I think, one of the most important debates because we're now looking at how do we actually make big reductions in emissions. And that discussion, frankly, is overdue, but we're having it. And uh, at the center of this is the question of what's the right role for markets? What's the right role for the state? Danny and I have a book out, Making Climate Policy Work. It's been out for a year or so. Um, that makes It's not a pro-market or anti-market book. It's an empirical book. It takes essentially and seriously the, the beautiful logic of using market forces to try and make reductions in emissions. Then it looks at how well have we performed around the world? How have these market uh, systems performed around the world? And with the one partial exception of the European Union emissions trading um, approach, 
with that one partial exception, the record is actually not that great. And, and in particular, um, we are very critical of cap and trade systems because of the cap and trade systems in effect trade the residual of emissions that are left over after regulatory instruments have done their work. And so um, uh, cap and trade systems almost create an illusion, we call it a Potemkin market, the illusion that the, that the market system is actually doing the work, work when you look behind the curtain, what you see is after market, after market, after market around the world, where these things have been put into place in China and in California and in the Northeastern United States, Quebec, on and on and on, what you see is that the market instrument's not actually doing most of the work. It's it's industrial policy, it's regulatory policy, and so on. One of the things we do in the book, it's hard to summarize a book, a big book, well, it's not a big book, but a, um, a pretty complex book in, in 10 minutes, as Danny and I are going to do. But one of the things we do in the book is we look at some of the places where our theory expected us, expected something to happen, and then the opposite happened. So for example, one of the early expectations was that these market-based systems were, would create a global price or increasing the international price on carbon. And then we have international trading of emission credits or maybe a global carbon tax. And then that would create a, a, a better global solution to allocate capital and effort uh, in the best places around the world. What we've seen in reality is the opposite. There's almost no international trading. And in fact, the lowest quality emission credits that are trading across borders um, are the are, are the are the credits, the offsets that are trading across borders. And that's because when you create a cap and trade system, you're in effect creating a new kind of money. And so the quality of your policy instrument is only as good as the quality of the underlying institutions. And that explains why Europe has been pretty successful in this and practically no other place has been pretty successful. And why jurisdictions, when they start getting really serious about their systems, are reluctant to link together lots of disparate uh, different cap and trade systems because in effect you get Gresham's law, you get the bad money driving the good money uh, out, of, out of circulation. One of the other expectations early on in the theory around using market instruments was that we needed the, the, a, a, a market system, a cap and trade system, for example, that had the broadest scope possible all different sectors included that that way the economy could figure out the lowest cost way the best sectors to allocate effort what you see instead is almost the opposite that one of the ironies in these cap and trade systems is that as you add more sectors the politics become different and more difficult and that's because the politics and the technological opportunities vary in every sector what's going on in steel is different from what's going on in automobiles different yet again from what's going on in electricity and so all of those different sectors have different political arrangements. And one of the things we've observed in many markets is that when you link transportation, you particularly make the politics very, very difficult for, uh, for the other sectors to, to get a high price on carbon. Because in so many countries, look at the yellow vest movement in, in France, look at the blowback in the United States against uh, high, uh, high emission prices on transportation fuels. People know what transportation fuels in particular cost. And so the politics of raising the prices on transportation fuels are different and harder than the politics of raising prices on electricity or a variety of other, uh, other areas. And so ironically, by linking all these different sectors together and following the economic logic, you actually make the politics harder. And this is what we're trying to grapple with uh, in the book centrally, is how do you put together and hold together a set of policy instruments that actually make uh, that actually make progress. Um, I, I'm going to just say a couple, couple more words and then hand it over uh, to Danny. One of the things we do in the book is we w this book is not designed to say we shouldn't use markets. Instead, it's designed to say we should use markets in the places that are amenable to market instruments. In particular, we think carbon tax systems perform much better than cap and trade systems because the marginal price on a carbon tax system is always there, even when there's regulation in place. And so we we advocate a number of reforms, including, frankly, the reforms that we've been seeing in the European uh, trading scheme that, that make it, in effect, more, uh, more tax-like. Uh, we also think that for the sectors of the economy where emission reductions are very difficult to achieve, that it's industrial policy and regulation that's really going to push the technological frontier, not... Uh, market instruments uh, uh, like carbon taxes. There are some sectors, in particular electric power, which are more amenable to uh, to these instruments, in part because the technologies are more mature. And so you're trying to use the market and a marginal price incentive to encourage firms to identify the lowest cost options and then to optimize around that. And that works when the technologies are more mature doesn't work so well when the goal is to push the technological frontier where you need a huge carbon price and it's frankly much easier politically 
uh, and practically to, to do that directly with industrial policy. I'm going to give the floor over to Danny, who's going to say a few more words about our larger argument, but before we uh, look for, very much look forward to the comments from Otmar and the debate. Thank you, David, uh, and thank you to the host for the chance to be here and to speak about these issues. I want to pick up on three issues that take some of the core arguments from our book, exactly as David outlined. Our book attempts to develop a logic for thinking through the political opportunities and challenges of when markets can work and, and when maybe they don't make as much sense. And I want to apply some of those basic insights to three issues today. One, what's going on in the European Union, where we as Americans are watching with keen interest uh, for what we see the most successful program in the world doing and some of the challenges it's facing right now. Um, I'm going to also touch on briefly the experience in California, where David and I both live and, and has arguably the most comprehensive cap and trade program, although not nearly as large as the European market. Um, and I also want to touch on the role of carbon offsets in the voluntary carbon market, which is a topic we spent a little bit of time on in the book, but I think it has some direct implications uh, as we see lots of voluntary activity these days. So to, so to begin with, let me talk about the European Union experience. Um, I think what, what's so striking about the global experience with markets is that basically no markets have succeeded in developing a carbon price signal that is significant enough to start to drive emission reductions and significantly change the investment trajectory and technological frontiers in the sectors we know need to change. The one major exception to that is the European Union's program. And we think there's a number of factors that explain this, including, including the consistent support um, that the European public and policymakers have expressed for climate policy. One of the other key things that had to happen in Europe was to move away from low quality offsets and to design the system to have a central banking-like function where policymakers can add or subtract allowances to the market supply and essentially help dictate where the prices are going to go in response to policy opportunities and political challenges. <laughs> this has worked relatively well. And I, and I think, again, we see this as an area of success that we try to highlight in the book as an example of how some of the smart strategies can be deployed. One of the challenges that's uh, coming up where, again, we are outsiders watching and doing our best to listen is in an environment where we have essentially global energy market crises happening in multiple countries at the same time, largely as a result of the war, um, the challenge of trying to hold together a complicated system when other policy issues are becoming very, very prominent and having direct impacts on energy prices, which has political consequences and which has competitiveness consequences, those are significant challenges. Um, and we're watching and, and seeing what we hope is some dynamic capacity to respond to those challenges where, again, the policy levers in this program can um, hopefully respond and prioritize and deprioritize opportunities to reduce emissions as the politics warrant and as is necessary to keep together a coalition that's strongly supportive of climate policy over time. One of the big challenges, of course, is that very few countries have a price on carbon that is at all comparable to the European price. And so the trade effects are quite significant. Um, I'm reading in the news as the European Parliament is debating concepts like a carbon border adjustment, which you know potentially help address these issues, but there's a lot of work to be done. And there are very few governments that are even close to the capacity and expertise that Europe has right now in order to run these kinds of programs and policies. So very interested to talk more about what that means, but the fact that there is a price that applies to the power sector and across the industrial sector creates challenges because there's essentially a single level of effort that's applied to all of these different sectors that are facing different concerns around energy price impacts from a political and a competitiveness perspective. Again, we see signs of, of successful management, but it's, it's not simple. Briefly on the California experience, uh, I can touch more on this if we want to get into it in the conversation. Um, California's program also includes transportation fuels. And because visibly increasing transportation fuels is one of the most difficult things you can ask a policymaker to do, our political system in California has largely tried to look the other way on the carbon market. We have assigned it the role to do all of our climate policy work in California but we are not actually following through with the design that's capable of doing that because the number one thing an elected official is afraid of in California is saying I'm raising the price of gasoline. And this emphasizes, although that would in theory be an, an economically efficient way to proceed, that it's very, very difficult politically to get that done. And if you tie in transportation fuel politics, it makes it hard to decarbonize other sectors using market-based signals. The last thing I wanna mention, mention um, Petra 
mentioned that I call myself a forensic climate economist. There are lots of crimes being committed against the atmosphere. Many of them are being done through low quality carbon offsets where essentially unregulated systems have been designed to create the appearance of trading credits that make a difference. This is becoming an almost impossible to manage problem with no governance. And we are seeing a lot of activity pick up as private offset credits, which are generally very, very low quality, are being held forward as equivalent to the success and experience of say the European Union's cap and trade program. Everybody is selling a ton, but some tons are, are high quality, like the European allowances, and some tons are very, very low quality. Markets do a very poor job of telling the difference between the two. And the political economy lessons from our book help explain why those two systems end up in very different places. So again, this is not an argument against using markets. It's an argument about using political economy tools to figure out when they work and what to do to make them work better when you can. So I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, and thank you to, for sticking to the timetable. I think we need another um, another session to talk about the forensic part of, of the issue, which unfortunately is not our topic today, but I think this is really something interesting. Right now, I want Otmar Edenhofer to respond right away to, to what we just heard. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, and uh, it's an enormous pleasure uh, to discuss this issue with, uh, with uh, Danny and, and, and David. And I'm very happy that we, we have now the opportunity to discuss this important issue. So carbon pricing, I would say many people would argue, okay, it might be a good policy. Uh, climate economists for a very long time have argued that uh, carbon pricing might be the first uh, best option. But in the end, uh, political economists and political scientists all the time argue it might be good policy, but it might be bad politics because it is very hard uh, to have a winning a coalition for such a thing. So in, in, in that sense, uh, many economists uh, are uh, not very successful to communicate this because they do not take into account significantly or sufficiently enough uh, the political environment. And in that sense, this, uh, this book is a, is a, a very interesting one and, and a very stimulating one. Uh, so the book uh, admits that carbon pricing might be theoretically desirable, but hard to implement. And in addition to that, they argued that advocates of market-based instruments have overplayed what market-based policy instruments in reality can uh, deliver. And therefore, policymakers should focus on pragmatic, politically feasible approaches for uh, reducing emissions. And the authors highlights here that regulatory and other industrial policy instruments do most of the heavy lifting. So uh, uh, the, the two others are not against the market instruments, but they, they want to find out what is the appropriate scope of the market instrument. So this is, from my point of view, what, what they want to do. And, and I agree with them. So uh, when uh, Daniel's arguing he's a forensic climate economist, I would say I'm a clinical climate economist because I want to understand under what specific conditions policy instruments can work. What I will do in my overview is uh, I, I would review a little bit the empirical spread of carbon pricing, and then I, I would provide some additional arguments regarding the political feasibility. So I would argue that uh, what's missing, so let me start with that, what's missing is a, a, a concise and a comprehensive meta study about the effects of carbon pricing. So we are carrying out such a study uh, here, I can only highlight a few examples so uh, that carbon pricing is effective in the UK. A carbon price has led to a substantial emission reduction in the electricity sector. And then he has admitted this, that uh, the electricity sector might be uh, a place where market uh, instruments, even according to the two authors, might work. Uh, I would say the difference is increasing in, in this empirical study after 2013. So we have seen a significant emission reduction because UK has introduced a carbon tax, a carbon price support in addition to the UETS. I believe that, uh, or I assume that uh, this will not cause too much difference because in the power sector, most people would agree uh, uh, carbon prices and cap and trade system, at least in the European context has worked. It's a little bit more tricky to, to think about the transport sector because the transport sector, uh, it is a sector which basically the price elasticity much, might be much lower than in the, in the electricity sector. 
And then the question is what policy packages work. And what we have done here is, uh, it's uh, not published yet, but uh, it's, uh, it's under review, that we have applied a machine learning method. And what we did is we, found, we, we want to find out what are the causal emission breaks over 25 years in the EU. And it turns out that only 10 significant policy-induced emission breaks in, in seven countries can be identified with this machine learning. And so this is just one example, which I have shown in Denmark. And it is obvious what the authors are also admitting is that it's not just only uh, carbon pricing schemes, so there are a lot of regulatory measures, but what we have identified is that successful policy intervention have led to a, a sharp reduction of emissions in the transport sector. It has a large reduction potential, but all of these packages have one important component. These are carbon pricing for fuel, uh, uh, carbon prices, fuel taxes, or road use taxes with green vehicle incentives. I'm not saying the carbon price has done the only work here, but it is also the case that the carbon prices are essential uh, to, for, for significant emission reduction, even in the transport sector. So we are just carrying out now a study where we try to understand what is the ban uh, of uh, the new registration of internal combustion engines in Germany for 2030. This is a heavily debated issue in the European Parliament, but also in Germany. And it turns out that, to make a, a long story short, uh, that uh, for a ban to have a meaningful impact on emissions, it has to be supple supplemented uh, with a significant carbon price, because otherwise emissions cannot be reduced. And this is quite obvious why this is the case, because you can only, with a, a ban, you only uh, ban the, 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 the new combustion engines, but you have to deal with the, uh, with the old car fleet and uh, to increase the turnover, to reduce the, and, and to increase the emissions of the driving, you need a CO2 price. And this is quite important. I'm not saying again, that bans are inherently bad, but uh, if you want to have emission reduction, it has to be complemented by some kind of carbon pricing schemes. Of course, the, the projected evolution of the carbon prices, so this is the, the most recent study, um, so this looks at least uh, uh, not so bad uh, that we have we, we can observe some increase in carbon price and also the scope is increasing. Uh, admittedly, the scope is is a little bit above uh, uh, twenty three percent of the, the global coverage. And the coverage, given the, the the climate policy goals we have, is 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 lousy. But still, it's interesting. It's increasing. Now, let me come to another aspect, and this is widely ignored by many economists, and these are the distributional consequences of these policy instruments. The distributional consequences are for, the, for an understanding of the politics absolutely crucial. And I'm not arguing here that we should go for a carbon price because it is the most efficient way. I think the carbon price has also some, some advantages if you think about the distributional effects. What we have done here is we have figured out what are the average burden on households uh, for standards and for CO2 pricing with a kind of a recycling. And it turns out that poorer households drive smaller cars and measured against their income, the costs of the standards hit them harder. The richest quintile has an income that it is about 3.5 times higher then of the poorest quintile, whilst using just under 1% more gasoline per kilometer. Poorer households travel less, uh, far less distance, and thus benefiting much less from increased uh, uh, energy efficiency of the cars. So uh, with an uncompensated CO2 price, standards are roughly at the same order of magnitude uh, from the distributional point of view. But uh, the CO2 prices allows you to generate revenues which then can be used for a compensation in particular of the poor uh, income households and equal per capita recycling. And this is what this graph shows from one of our most recent studies here at the red line. This is the uncompensated carbon price. And it is obvious that an uncompensated carbon price has strong regressive effects, uh, which might induce yellow, yellow vests and all sorts of, um, of a threat to social cohesion. 
But if it is complemented with equal per capita recycling, you can create a benefit for the 20% of the poorest households. And in the debate, I would like to highlight a little bit on the current gasoline crisis where we basically can apply uh, the same instrument. Now, let me come uh, to my last point. There is a, a conventional wisdom uh, in, in, in the debate. Many people argue, okay, uh, we, have, we had traditional climate policy and the traditional climate policy was quite okay, in particular in the power sector. And we have been able to, 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 do, to implement uh, carbon markets, at least in Europe. But when it comes to the high cost options where we have to decarbonize uh, the, the industry sector, and we have to decarbonize the, the transport sector, carbon prices are too high in the end uh, to, drive the, uh, the, the, uh, to drive the decarbonization pathway. And therefore people say, okay, carbon pricing did a job, probably not the most important one, it did a job in the past, but for the future, we need a completely different instrument. And to a certain extent, I agree because nobody believes that uh, immediately we can have a carbon price around 300 euros per ton CO2. Why 300? This is the order of magnitude which would be needed uh, for producing hydrogen, come up with synthetic fuels and negative emissions. But again, what I would like to highlight here is that when we, when we enter the area of the high carbon prices, in particular, when we enter technological changes, hydrogen sector, synthetic fuels, negative emissions, so, Sooner or later, we need high carbon prices. Why? We need high carbon prices because if the carbon prices are not high, we wouldn't use, for example, atmospheric CO2 to produce synthetic fuels. In that sense, I would say as an immediate step, of course, industrial policy and subsidies are needed. But what is needed in the future is a phase in of carbon prices. So this is my argument. And I can summarize this here in, in the following way. So in the past, we have seen a way where the political costs of standards were much lower than of the carbon prices. But in the future, when we basically want to achieve the ambitious uh, goals, so then carbon prices in the end uh, cause much lower costs. And therefore, I think um, uh, in the future, command and control instruments uh, uh, have lower costs for low mitigation scenarios. I admit with that. But when we want to be more ambitious, carbon pricing in the future will become more important. So my disagreement with the authors is not so much uh, about their, uh, their factual statements. It is about the, the design of the future climate policy, because I think in the past, indeed, we had regulatory measures, we had bans and we had subsidies. And to a certain extent, they have basically shown the success. But in the future, when it comes to the deep carbonization, we need something different. So my last statement is technology standard subsidies, mand mandates, and bans. They are just fine. And there are many reasons, even from an economic point of view, to use this technology standard and subsidies. But my argument is when not complemented by prices, so this will not lead to this deep carbonization uh, pathways, which are needed to uh, basically to achieve uh, ambitious climate goals. So a dismal scientist's perspective on the political case against carbon pricing. I understand the salience argument. Prices increase the salience of the cost of climate policy, fine. But my response would be, this holds only for the low level of ambition. Little empirical testing as voters respond to other instruments like BENS. The first empirical studies show voters also respond to the high costs of, of uh, technology standards. Attribution, Subsidies, bans, and standards can be clearly attributed to politicians and parties. This is the reason why policymakers like them. This, my response would be, okay, this assumes a great deal of sophistication and attention on the part of the voters. In the end, attribution is nothing which is given by nature. It can be communicated. Volatility of prices in unregulated market, which is very much related also to the offset market, I agree. My response would be a price corridor. The last thing is really the hard thing. And here, I think this is worthwhile uh, for a discussion. And it's the commitment problem. Given the dynamics of electoral policy, it is rarely credible for politicians to commit to a price trajectory consistent with the climate ambition. And indeed, 
I think this is hard to resolve. And the reason why we have been more successful in Europe with these pricing schemes might, uh, uh, might, might, might be the fact that we have uh, an, at the EU level and the EU level uh, can, uh, can be used as a, as a commitment device. Okay, carbon pricing, good policy and not so dismal politics. To summarize, given ambitious uh, climate targets, carbon pricing will become increasingly important. Without carbon pricing, the other policy instruments are either ineffective or have negative distributional consequences. Other instruments have lower salience in the short run, but higher mitigation costs than market instrument in the long run. And policymakers' lack of commitment might make subsidies for investments, spends, and standards tempting, but increasing costs reduce the visibility of this route. The central question is, what kind of self-enforcing institutions can increase the commitment capacity of climate policymakers? And this is something which is, from my point of view, at the core of the debate. People, and from my point of view, this is the main argument of the book, uh, it, is, it is a lack of commitment which basically uh, hinders us uh, to go over that. But I think we have to work with that. And uh, this is something which uh, needs a little bit more debate than we might find a better balance between commitment and flexibility. Thanks a lot. All right. A lot of food for thoughts, and I think a lot of food for, for debate. Let me uh, tell the audience, you can, there's no problem if you want to um, send in your questions in, in, in German, I will be able to translate them. Dare to ask simple questions. This is also my job. I think my job is also to translate economists. And the first uh, question with, with, with which I will try to translate the debate a bit into the real political um, area where I'm at every day and um, where, I, what I, where I have to deal with is, Otma, you actually argued um, a lot in favor of the of the CO2 price. At the same time, you admitted that only I think 23% of, of the CO2 emissions are covered by, by, by pricing. And your last um, point also was that you even you have not yet found this kind of institution that make politicians to go for higher CO2 prices. So to ask you the, the, the question very, very simple. Even you who believe that this is the most brilliant kind of, 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 of instrument that economists have, how can you make, how do you argue with politicians that still tell you, look, we can't really go for real high CO2 prices? Uh, I mean, so how do you translate your brilliant instrument? Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but so I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I feel very misunderstood uh, if you portray me as somebody who says, this is something which is so brilliant and it is so efficient, it is so wonderful. How can, how can the dirty word ignore this? This is not my argument. My argument is technology standards, subsidies and bans will not lead to the emission reduction we need for ambitious climate policy. At least it has to be complemented with, with, with ambitious uh, carbon pricing. So this is my argument. It's not about efficiency, it's about effectiveness. And what I'm saying is also uncompensated carbon prices are quite regressive. This is not good. You, know, you have to do a, a, a recycling scheme. And, 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 and the commitment problem is, is, a, is, a, is an interesting one. And probably you, you, you know that uh, last week in the European Parliament, uh, there was basically a rejection of the second UETS. Let's see what will happen in, in the next two weeks. My argument is not, it is so efficient, it is so brilliant, it is so nice, and it is so neat. What I'm saying is even there are many good arguments why we should go in some cases for subsidies. And the last thing, for example, financing pilot projects for direct air capture, financing uh, some projects for synthetic fuels, that's, that's uh, a lot of R&D investments. That's fine and that's important. But when this is not, not, not complemented by this, um, then, then it, will, it will not lead to this uh, effective emission reduction. And you ask me, so what is the response for the politicians? I would say the politicians are at least, and this might be not a surprise, uh, but not consistent. They say, okay, carbon neutrality by 2050, why not by 2030? And if you explain them about the mitigation costs and then the price says, oh, that, that might be too costly. 
and 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 this is something which 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 uh, which, which which should be clear. Bans, standards, and subsidies are not costless options. It's about the salience. And what I'm saying is, in the past, carbon pricing was too salient, and 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 the other one. Uh, uh, so it, it it was a little a little bit hidden in the in the in the future. I would say the salience argument uh, will not work because we will see also increasing costs and people will see and observe this increasing costs of the other instruments. So this is what, what, what I can offer here in, in this debate. And if people say, okay, uh, then we have two ambitious climate targets. So then we are in a, different, in a different debate. Then we are talking about the goals and not about the means. Okay, David. Yeah, I just, I, I want to pick up on this because I think this is a very important place of both agreement and disagreement. Um, so first, I'm shocked to discover that politicians are inconsistent because we never see that in any other area no, of political no. behavior. It's just amazing. Um, but I think this really goes to the salience point. I really appreciate Otmar bringing out the salience point because a big part of our argument is that in particular in some sectors, and as Danny underscored uh, in the transportation sector in particular, the salience generates these extra political uh, these extra political difficulties. So I think it is very, very helpful to, let me just say two things about this. One is, our argument is not that there's no role for carbon pricing. Our argument is that in particular, there's a role for carbon tax-like mechanisms instead of cap and trade mechanisms for reasons I mentioned, and that they are going to complement what's what really pushes the technological frontier, especially in these hard to abate sectors. And so it's exactly as Otmar showed and as uh, Danny suggested, that in the sectors where the technologies are more mature, notably electric power, and maybe we're gonna to get to that point in gas eventually, not initially, that, that carbon pricing could play, could play a bigger role. So it's gonna be some kind of hybrid where there's probably gonna be a bigger role. And this to me, frankly, in this book project was a surprise to me, the extent to which I came around to the idea of a much, frankly, much bigger role for the state. That was not my more normal, my, not, my, not my temperament. So I think that's crucially important. And then the last thing I wanna say is about, uh, is about the future. So obviously we can't measure the future, but if a theory like the one we lay out, that Danny and I lay out in our book is helpful, um, it's going to be helpful in describing what might happen in the future. And I think we would we would see a bigger role for carbon pricing in the future, but for the different causal logic than the one that I think Otmar has laid out here, which is in the future, there's going to be an even bigger role for direct industrial policies, regulatory policies, bans, and so on to reshape markets. And then as those markets be, have more mature technologies that are available to them, then more sectors are gonna start behaving like the electric power sector where there's a role for carbon pricing. I don't know if it's gonna be up in the 300 euro range, but it is just sobering to remind us that, <clears throat> look, for example, what, what, the, what Equinor is doing in the North Sea with this big Northern Lights carbon capture and storage project. This is a company that faces the highest carbon price in the world for its offshore operations and could not justify doing these big transformative carbon capture and storage projects without direct industrial policy, without, without um, direct support. And so I think that's an example where the carbon pricing is playing a role, absolutely. And then, but what makes the project feasible as well is this direct industrial policy. And that's a kind of key argument in, in, in the book is that, is, that, is that that more of that is, is, is doing the work. And, and, and that's why when you see only 23% of global emissions covered in carbon pricing, the picture is even grimmer than that, Petra, because the average price outside of Europe, the average price for that 23% is tiny. It's a couple of dollars. Let me try to sharpen uh, the difference between you a little bit further, because I, I think there's a certain agreement that we might need a couple of uh, political instruments to get things done. But I, as a journalist, I see that the focus of politicians is quite often very limited on one or two things that they are able to get done. So my question is actually, if you had to advise, advise government, you, your advice would rather be get away with the CO2 pricing, don't put your political future on, on, on that part, look for, for other things, look for um, subsidies, for, for um, sectorial policies, because this will be more efficient. Whereas Otma says, no, it's still the CO2 pricing, which where you put, should put most of your effort into. Is this correct? Let me comment briefly on this, and then I want to ask Danny be, be, to comment on this, because Danny's directly advising governments, in particular in the United States. And again, I think the European situation, because of the quality 
of the European administrative legal arrangement because of the EU backstop for, for improving commitment and improving credibility. The European situation is really very different. But that's a, Petra exactly what I would argue is that um, it's not so much you know, ignore carbon pricing altogether, but if you really want to transform um, uh, these sectors and make big reductions in emissions, you have to have a much bigger role for smart industrial policy. The next book that I'm working on was coming out in August with Chuck Sable is, is on exactly that, how industrial policy and how companies deal with uncertainty where they have to invest in new technology, they don't know what to do, and so they run experiments. And, and, and that part of the picture which Danny and I begin to sketch out in our book, that part of the picture is, is what I, I'm taking up uh, next, but I think that's exactly our, would be our advice. Danny? I'll just add, again, this isn't an argument where one has the capacity to push forward on carbon pricing not to do that. We think where you can, that's a good thing to do. But just briefly to comment on the institutional capacities, Otmar makes a very good point. When you combine carbon pricing or frankly regulatory standards with rebates, you can make uh, policies that have costs and have regressive costs progressive so that lower income households come out ahead. One of the huge challenges is how do you actually get money into people's hands? So for years I've been working on this issue in the US and in California, and we frankly don't have instrumental capacities to take money, supposing you had the money, you had the policy, and get them out to all of the people who are affected. I hope that your capacity to do that in Germany and Europe is significantly better than ours. But when you, when you look under the hood at what's required to accomplish some of these policy strategies and carbon pricing, it takes sometimes building entire new state capacity to do things like reach all of the people who pay taxes, reach all of the people who are affected by higher energy prices. And if you have to stand that capacity up as a prerequisite to addressing one of the major political challenges of the carbon pricing strategy, you can see how that's a tough sell in an environment where somebody hasn't already put in the work to get that done. So, and the reason I bring this up is because many countries and jurisdictions are in that situation. Not all are as capable as moving on these issues as uh, many countries in Europe and Scandinavia are. I don't want to be awkward, but um, if I if you were based in Europe, maybe you, your position would be rather closer to Otmar's. And if Otmar were in the United States, he would be closer to yours. Is it in the, in the end geography that determines your position? It's administrative capacity. Um, this this commitment issue is really really important because almost everything that's interesting in deep decarbonization is capital intensive, requires long time horizons and really, really sensitive to the capacity of government in what using whatever combination of policy mechanisms it's, it's using government to send a reliable signal, whether it's to state owned enterprises or private enterprise, you know, at every country varies and so on. And so I think we often in comparative politics world often equates that with region, but that's I, my view is that's been sloppy social science that what's really matters here is the quality and credibility of the underlying um, administrative institutions and, 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 and political institutions. One of the, I think one of the opportunities that Danny and I saw when we were writing this book is there's now been such a huge variation in the experiences with cap and trade and carbon tax mechanisms across a varied different sets of sectors in national and subnational um, systems of, of, of policy and administration, that there's a lot of variants out there now that can be used by social scientists to try and build and test theories of the type that we're doing in this book. Could you just very briefly, because I think not all of our um, of the people listening to us are economists, the difference between cap and trade and CO2 pricing? Can you put it into three sentences? Sure. I mean, um, so a cap and trade system basically puts a limit on the total allowable emissions, at least for the covered sectors, and then leaves the market um, to figure out the price level. So that, so the idea is is that then the market will then the, the permits trade on the open market and then the trading price tells you in a, reveals in effect the information about the the cost at the margin of controlling those emissions um, in, a, in a carbon tax system you do the opposite you you put a put a limit on the price you say this is the price and then the market figures out the quantity that's needed there if everyone had perfect information the two would be in effect identical Everyone doesn't have perfect information. And one of the reasons that Danny and I are big fans of carbon taxes as a complementary pricing mechanism, as opposed to cap and trade systems, is that we think the carbon tax in effect is like a metaphor for the allowable, politically viable level of effort. And so when you can set that level of effort and then firms see that, that, that cost in all of their investment decisions, then that's politically more credible and stable 
than one where the prices kind of bounce all over the place. And so to Otmar's point, I really appreciated his slide saying the four areas of disagreement to the, the we completely agree in the area with regard to volatility in these prices is that the way you 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 lower the volatility in a cap and trade system is you in effect do as Danny described it central banker functions you add and subtract volumes of credit so that you in effect transform a cap and trade system into something that's de facto more like a carbon tax system yeah i would like to to to, to respond because that's that's quite important because this shows the area of agreement and disagreement first of all i would say the whole issue of carbon pricing is in the end an investment in state capacity so this is this is this is the essential point. Now I would like to 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 highlight at least three dimensions of the state capacity. The first one is, I think in Europe we cannot have a carbon tax. This has constitutional reasons. We have to live with the cap and trade, and therefore I am a strong uh, proponent of a carbon price floor in order to reduce the volatility and to get rid of all the things uh, Danny and David have described. I think this is an, an area of strong agreement, and I, I fully agree uh, when uh, on your evaluation of the advantages and disadvantages of, of carbon pricing. And I'm also 100% uh, on your side when you talk about this uh, offset issue, the voluntary carbon markets, and even what you said, David, uh, on, on the international carbon markets. And let me highlight this as a, a second dimension. So it is often said by many people in the public that economists advocate one unique carbon price across all the sectors, across all the countries. But in fact, this is not true. This is not true. So I'm doing now a paper with my colleague of Mark Fleber, who show that even from a purely efficiency point of view, one unique carbon price is not efficient. If you have one unique carbon price, this would require massive transfers massive transfers either across regions or either across the sectors. Otherwise, you cannot do this. And, and, and therefore, uh, I think- could, could you please short, briefly explain why this would be killing um, the whole thing? Yeah, yeah because, because uh, think about the, the best way to think about this is think about India and, and Europe or India and the United States. So we have one goal, let's say a focal point, uh, the two degree or the, the 1.5 degree limit in the end, right? It doesn't matter. So in the end, the whole world has to reduce emissions. So if, if there would be one unique carbon price of $100 per ton CO2, so the impact, the distributional impact on India would be much higher than uh, compared to, to US. And, India. and why should India or another like Vietnam or Indonesia pay such a high price? You can only do this if, if they're basically, we would say, okay, we would transfer to a certain extent money in order to, to make the whole thing uh, affordable in order to, to basically to, uh, to, to, to harmonize the willingness to pay of, of, of all the countries. So th this, is, this is very important to understand. And this is, by the way, the reason why I fully agree that a global cap and trade system will never work because you have one unique carbon price, but then you, you have to, to take care of the distributional issue. So then you have to reallocate all the initial endowments which is basically a nightmarish thing and, and, and all international cooperation will break down if you would do this. This is the reason why I believe we should, we should have uh, not negotiations about a global cap and trade system, but because about uh, minimum prices uh, among a coalition of the willing. This would be from my point of view, uh, much more doable. It's, 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 it's hard enough, but, but this is this, this, is this, this, this myth that the, 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 the unique carbon price uh, is, is efficient. And the, the last thing, a practical thing, because uh, then he said, do you have the state capacity to recycle the money? Interesting enough, last two weeks ago, Austria decided exactly to do this. They have invested in the state capacity. By next year, they will recycle the money back to the citizens. And to make very clear that the money they generate via carbon prices or this kind of Peruvian taxes will be recycled back to, 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 to the citizens. I think this is a, a quite credible uh, a, a credible promise. And, and I think all of you agree that in the end, the commitment problem is, is at the core of, of the whole thing. And, and I, I, I believe that uh, uh, the central banking function that he has highlighted is something which the EU Commission is in the end doing. The EU Commission is, is functioning already like a, a kind of a central carbon bank. 
And to be honest, if we, I'm 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 done in a, in, a, in a second, if we would if if we would do this a little bit more explicit, we could strengthen the commitment problem, or the, we could strengthen the commitment capacity um, uh, 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 to a larger extent. But I think this is a very well taken point. The EU Commission is basically functioning as a kind of a European carbon bank, de facto, not the euro. But let, let's stick for a second still with the with this idea of a global um, CO2 price in the global global market. Um, one of the questions that um, that I see in the chat is that um, you you very very well explained us why it's uh, not an easy go to have the why it will not be possible to have the same um, CO2 price between India and Germany, for example, or between India and the EU. One of the arguments that um, that I heard from you and the the others too as well is that it's it's rather difficult to also have one CO2 price between for, for the for all the sectors. And the question that Lars Heidemann is raising, why do you, I think three of you agree that it's rather toxic to add the transport, especially the transport sector, to have the same CO2 price for all for the transport sector and the other sectors as well. Who could go, who could answer that question? I'd be happy to, to start and, and welcome uh, other perspectives. So I think one of the core insights from our book is that the politics vary by sector. They vary according to the salience of the sector, which can vary by place and time as well. And they vary according to the technological options for reducing emissions. And, and something I think I heard all of us agreeing on is the electricity sector is a, is a fairly good sector from the standpoint of the, the political challenge. That's because we have lots of technologies that are ready to go largely as a result of industrial policy and other forms of government intervention. Renewable energy is now cheap. We have other frontier technologies that can be deployed. And the electricity industry is a well-regulated industry in most countries, which means policymakers have tools for addressing regressive impacts. They don't have to stand up new administrative capacity to do that. So the combination of those forces makes that sector and the technological opportunities in it relatively easy to address with carbon pricing. Conversely, when you look at transportation, that may be the most politically salient and challenging with relatively few options that are price sensitive. And so that makes it hard. The argument we make in the book is the industrial sector is very heterogeneous. There are very different experiments going on in cement and steel and other carbon intensive, capital intensive industries. Whereas as David highlighted, even in places that have the highest carbon prices, the firms that are trying to experiment on deployment of those technologies require more support and engagement from the state to make that happen. So one of the central arguments from our book is when you combine the sectors and put them under a single carbon pricing policy, you risk that the carbon pricing policy can only be as ambitious as the least constraining sector is politically. So standard economic advice, and I'm, I'm delighted to hear Atmar is, is open-minded about this. Standard economic advice says put all of the sectors, put all of the countries together, go for one price. We're arguing more in the opposite direction, which is to say, if you want carbon pricing, it applies best sector specific and jurisdiction specific. So many carbon prices um, is a much more realistic way to think about using carbon pricing to complement all of the other strategies that are out there. I heard some agreement, maybe some disagreement on that, but we really think the sectors yeah. are different. Yeah, so, so that's that's a very good point. And, and here uh, we, we can identify uh, very nicely uh, the, the agreement and the disagreement. So first of all, I, I agree, I fully agree, it would be completely impossible now, today, to integrate the transport sector in, in, the, uh, in the ETS-1, where basically it's the ETS for, for electricity, for the, electric, for the power market and for the industry. And therefore, the, the EU decided, and I was involved in, in, in the design of this, a second ETS, where basically the transport and the building sector is, is, is included. So, and, and this requires a much higher carbon price. Of course, it requires a higher carbon price. And, 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 and there is a, an inefficient, let's say, division from, from, the, from a static efficiency point of view. It is an inefficient division of labor between the two sectors. But if you want to do a carbon price, uh, so uh, you say it very lightly, so the, 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 the most con uh, politically constrained sector determines the level of the carbon price. Mm -hmm. Again, in an ideal world, you could, you, could, you could transfer money from one sector to another to get rid of this, but this is practically across the sectors not feasible. However, so this is the, 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 the point of 
of agreement. Now it comes to the disagreement. When we want to do deep carbonization, we cannot think that the transport sector, the power sector, and the industry sector are completely different things. So we have to think about direct and indirect electrification. Sector coupling becomes important. As soon as you start with sector coupling, in the end, what you are doing is you are doing an industrial uh, carbon management. And this, for this purpose, you need in the long run a carbon price. And therefore, my proposal always was, we start with two different prices, but over time, we try to make sure that we can basically combine both systems. So in the end, not the starting point, but, but as, a, as a focal point in the future, we have a, a, a unique carbon price, at least not all sectors, because the agriculture sector is a, is a different thing. It is probably not wise to, to include the, the agriculture sector in, in the system. But then you have at least among the sectors which are important for direct and indirect electrification. But, but this is something which, which requires a, a decade and has to be complemented by all sorts of of, of, of support for pilot projects uh, and, and, and so on. So, but, but, but for me, this industrial carbon, industrial uh, carbon cycle management is in the future such, such a complex thing that it is for me not conceivable that, that you can run and design and, and steer such a system uh, purely with, with uh, bans and subsidies and, and standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's very, very quick. I, I, I think that's very well articulated. You want to get as quickly as possible to a system where you're, you're, where firms are selecting more mature technologies and where the market's playing a bigger role. Um, I think at this stage right now, it's unknowable how quickly that's going to happen. Maybe it's a decade. Maybe it's longer. Sometimes we discover things happen faster. Sometimes they don't. I just also want to underscore that that when you're doing when you're engaged in a complete industrial transformation, just want to underscore a point that Otmar made. The boundaries around the sectors get kind of fuzzy uh, because you know what's important is the role for steel changes. If you have a bigger role for you know bamboo instead of steel, um, uh, the role for for in, in transportation really changes when you electrify transportation because then suddenly the transport sector is also the electric sector, and so what in effect is happening is we're running these pilots, having these bands complementing them uh, to some degree with with a with a measure of carbon pricing and then as those technologies then mature and the boundaries around the different sectors are, are in effect rewritten then to the extent feasible you use markets to be able to optimize uh, optimize those choices that for for most sectors right now is still significantly in the future what about the speed question? I mean, we all know that time is, is not running out, but um, that the time when we overstep 1.5 to 1.5 degrees is, is getting closer. So what about the the speediest, best possibilities that we have? Is well, this maybe I can just talk briefly about this because I've never thought 1.5 was feasible. I've actually never thought two was feasible. That's a larger debate. Probably that's not the subject of today. But I, but I think the, the reason that today's debate is important is because this debate and similar debates that are happening right now about policy instruments and how do you put together and hold together political support um, for action, which is you know, greater in Europe than anywhere else on the planet. Europe has begun, been the reliable leader on climate. Parts of the U.S. are, are reliable leaders, but not all the U.S. And go around the world, you see uh, highly, highly vari variable pictures. I think that's the real debate. And what we need to do is, is have programs that are as cost effective as possible are highly effective in terms of making big reductions in emissions. And we move those as quickly as we can. When I take a step back from that process as someone who studied the history of technological change, I don't see that happening at the speed you need for one and a half degrees, certainly, but probably for two degrees. And so therefore there's kind of a whole bias built into the whole debate that's underplayed the role of dealing with climate impacts and, and overplayed the role of mitigation, not, not the mitigation is not important, quite the opposite. But just that if you really work the problem hard, which is I think what we're now talking about doing here, you still don't push the system as quickly as you need for two degrees. And in addition, probably the political, um, the global environment is not one where collaboration is as its best at the moment. I know that the German government is, we are heading for the G7 and in, in Germany, the, the German government is trying to get some content into its climate club where we have... Yeah issues like border adjustment, taxes and all this. And I don't think that they're really, really 
going as quickly as they as, as they should. Peter, well, I, uh, no. sorry. Uh, I, I think it is important uh, when we when we have such a debate. When you say, "What about the speed?" or "What about the distribution of things?" Then we we have to make sure that we compare the right things, right? And we should not compare uh, the, the the first best carbon price with second best standards. So th this doesn't make sense. So make sure that we compare the right things. And if we compare the right things, it is obvious that technology standards we are we are very successful to increase the efficiency, for example, of cars. But standards were not successful to reduce, to reduce emissions. So this is something which is important. And when you ask the speed issue, the, the myth, so to say, that subsidies and bans and standards are much more quickly than, 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 than prices is the wrong question. From my point of view, the, whole, the right question is, what is the appropriate sequencing of policy instruments? And this is, therefore, I think it is, it is not helpful if we, if, we, if, if, we, if we continue the same debate for the next decade, where some economists say, oh, I have a first best policy, and then a political science says, oh, this is, from a political point of view, not, 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 not feasible. So we, we should basically say, okay, we have a policy, and let's try to test this policy under specific political circumstances, and let's figure out what, what is the, the, the possibility. And if it turns out that we cannot be fast enough, so then from my point of view, and this is, this is missing in the whole debate is, so what can we do to invest in state capacity? So carbon pricing is not, is not saying you don't need the state. You need for a carbon price even more state capacity. And you have to invest in the state capacity. And this is something which we should have in mind when, when it is not. So I, I studied a little bit the example of Austria with this recycling scheme. This is not an easy go, but, but they invested in the state capacity instead of saying it's, 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 it's impossible. And I think this is, this is equally important when we talk about speed and what kind of policy instruments can be implemented. So we should then uh, be explicit. Is it under the given state capacity? And what can we do to enhance the state capacity? Anyone of you I, want, want to comment? Okay, look, I, I, I agree with that completely. And state capacity is not a static concept. And for too long, people have treated it as a static concept. There's a logical extension to this argument, which is maybe beyond the scope of today's debate, which is that what we're going to see now around the world is huge variation in state capacity. We already have that. And plausibly, that inequality, if you like, is going to go up. And that has big, big implications for the decarbonization debate, because if it's capital intensive, it requires long time horizons, credible policies and highly capable states. And some states are investing, other states are not investing. My hunch is that a very large part of the story in the coming decades around decarbonization is going to be the growing inequality in state capacity and the capacity actually to invest in these emission uh, these emission reductions. Now that intersects obviously with the debate that we're talking about today, because whether you think carbon pricing is gonna have a bigger role or a smaller role, you think industrial policy is gonna have a bigger role or a smaller role, all of these are mechanisms that require much more capable state. Capabilities vary, but the capabilities of state are just vitally important. Danny, how optimistic are you? Pessimistic? I I, th I think David's got it right. I think capacity is the big issue. And I think a lot, you know, frankly, working in jurisdictions where capacity is a big constraint. And one of the things I reflect on is carbon pricing doesn't work very well in those conditions. Lots of things don't work very well in those conditions. Um, but in a lot of respects, jurisdictions that are struggling with capacity take the situation as they find it. So the decision by the German auto manufacturers to shift away from internal combustion engines, the decision by the Chinese engine manufacturers to move into zero emission vehicles, that means that jurisdictions that don't have as active a presence, whether on standards or carbon pricing, are going to see the, the sort of ramifications of those technological changes. So I see the, the technology shifting activities being particularly important for jurisdictions that, that don't have a lot of technical capacity in their administrative state. Um, and to be perfectly honest, when I look at those transformations, I don't see carbon pricing driving those transformations. Although I agree with Otmar that the more we push on that and the deeper we go, the more we need to center on efficiency given the scale of the problem. But in terms of the sequencing, the things that move the frontier are rarely carbon pricing. And I was interested to hear, I think I heard Otmar say that 
the sequencing carbon pricing is, is more important later than it is earlier. That is not the standard prescription that economists gave 10 years ago, and, and maybe wiser economists like Gottmar had always been in a different place. But to me, that feels like a very different sequencing than the sort of standard textbook arguments we hear where when you don't have capacity, a carbon price makes it easy to, to throw your hands up and say the market will take care of all of this. Mm -hmm. When in practice, I think jurisdictions that don't have that capacity basically are free riding on the capacity of others to transform individual sectors. It's very interesting. One of the lessons that I'm already drawing is that this idea that one size fits all and carbon pricing could be this one size fits all thing is just not true because every country is different, every region is different, and maybe in Europe we can really go ahead with the carbon pricing because we have lots of experience, whereas in some of the of the US um, states or even in other countries, it's just not the way to go because we don't have the institutions. Yeah, but, but I think it is important to understand that indeed, and this is something which I will emphasize, state capacity is not a static concept. And here I would like to highlight another thing. So we are talking about positive carbon prices, but there are also negative carbon prices with our subsidies on fossil fuels. And now there's an, a very interesting, a very interesting debate in countries like I'm a little bit involved in Indonesia to get rid of fossil fuel subsidies. And, and, and this was partly driven by, by the debate on CBAM in Europe. And, and we should not ignore this, this aspect that- Can you explain when, CBAM just for a second because I don't think that everybody knows it. Okay, so so what, so we had a, a roughly roughly speaking in Europe a debate that we we basically we want to impose a, a tariff on carbon intensive goods. It's technically speaking much more complicated. But this is the, the story. So and and this was a threat, so to say. Europe said we we we, we contemplate this and 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 we might do this. And then basically Europe is is a, is a sets to a certain extent standards here, and and in some countries people become quite concerned about this threat and, and start to think about what can we do on carbon pricing or can we at least reduce the fossil fuel subsidies. And if you, and, and I fully agree, there is a lot of variation around the globe. And if you see how different countries, even unusual suspects, the unusual suspects have phased out fossil fuel subsidies, then, then this shows that even in countries which you might not conceive as the, the forerunner in, in this respect can 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 very cleverly change this this state capacity issue and therefore for me that this is really the, the, the crucial thing and, and and in the debate we have always the same things and I, I I become really tired about this debate where people always say this is not possible of course some things are not possible today but they might be possible tomorrow. And if it's not possible tomorrow and we invest in the right thing, it might become possible then uh, in, 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 in a later stage. And, and, and it seems to me that, that analyzing the state capacities in climate policy is something which is in, in incredibly important. And, and also the design of, and I, I think, so the combination of forensic climate economics and clinical climate economics is exactly the way to go over this because we want to understand state capacity it has something to do with corruption, but we want to understand under what specific conditions you can change state capacity to make important things happen. Okay, let me can make I, it, clear. sorry, you were briefly? Yeah, just, just, just briefly, I want to say two things. Um, first on the state capacity issue, I had the pleasure a few years ago of working with the World Bank doing a big study on the political economy of subsidy reform. And this is exactly what we found is that the places, the, it was the unlikely countries that did a lot of subsidy reform on fossil fuels. And it was one, the key enabling condition was not treating state capacity as static. It was investing in smart cards and other mechanisms for being able to channel resources back. The other thing I wanted to say is about this CBAM, the border adjustment mechanism. I think one of the areas where there's a significant disagreement still is about the relative roles of, of regulatory and industrial policy instruments and market instruments. The more that people believe that the arguments that Danny and I are making are plausible about this big role for regulatory instruments and so on, the more we have to think about CBAM adjustments, the border adjustments, as not just being differentials in price, uh, but also being the regulatory equivalents. And the World Trade Organization has been through this in a lot of other areas and non-tariff um, tr uh, trade barriers. And I think that the implications of that we haven't really grappled with. And we've assumed that we could just identify by looking at relative price levels what the right border adjustment should be. We don't think that's true. Okay. 
the cut that I want to make is because we have a couple of questions um, regarding the distributional effects of, of um, CO2 pricing. Simon Jüngling, for example, asks, what are the main challenges, challenges of impl implementing a recycling scheme? Regressive effects are avoidable, yet opponents of carbon pricing appear to have success in convincing the public that carbon pricing is somehow unfair. Um, why? Yeah, that's that's quite quite easy because the the poor households uh, spend uh, a much higher share of the income for 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 transport and for heating, so a carbon price is 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 regressive, and so we can discuss the precise schemes of revenue recycling. Uh, so this makes the carbon price progressive, and and again, uh, the missing part, uh, uh, one important missing component in the whole debate over the last ten years was that basically uh, economists have used an efficiency argument and, and they assume that the distribution of issues will be resolved in, 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 a, in an almost uh, costly way. By the way, this was also the problem with free trade. We said that the winners could compensate the losers, but the losers are not interested in hypothetical compensation. They are interested in real compensation. And, and if we say carbon pricing is a wonderful thing because the winners could compensate the losers and, and, and they have a welfare gain. So this is a hypothetical welfare test, but in the end, the losers are interested in real compensation. So in, in that sense, and I worked over the last uh, two years very, very uh, hardly on, on this issue to, to, to work out. And by the way, you might say, okay, this CO2 pricing recycling, this is a purely academic exercise. So to, to make some things a little bit more feasible. But what we, will see, what we will experience over the next few months, in particular in Europe, is a sharp increase of the gas prices. Mm -hmm. And this is something which is really threatening, threatening the social cohesion in, in Germany, in Europe, in the European Union. And this has nothing to do with climate policy. This is a pure fact because of uh, the, the, the war in, 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 in the Ukraine. And we come up with an analysis, is, are the the current compensation packages the government has basically designed sufficient for this. And we come to the conclusion it's not. And therefore, some kind of uh, per capita recycling, some kind of uh, helicopter money will be absolutely essential because when we do not care of this issue, so if, it, if, if this is burned in the historical memory of people that fossil fuel price increase comes with a decline of social cohesion, uh, with 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 a decline of social justice, so then the whole legitimacy of climate policy will also uh, erode significantly. And and I think um, even if you don't believe climate policy is an important issue, we have to deal with the Ukraine. This distributional issue will become over the next few months a big big issue. David, isn't there the same kind of problem when you give large subsidies to uh, to to companies because you you you, you you're convinced that an industrial policy is the good policy to do and but this is also money that needs to be raised by taxes yeah so there's a uh, one thing that we haven't talked about today with regard to the book is there's a whole chapter in the book i think it's chapter six it's about what do you do with the money mm -hmm. and just em emphasizing that i'm saying that's that part of the whole debate about the design of market instruments has been really underplayed partly because so many of the market instruments are cap and trade systems and they don't spin up as large resources as carbon tax systems. Um, and then most of the carbon tax systems, the money flows back through the state and is used for a variety of other purposes. Um, if you can create a, a, a revenue recycling program that's seen as credible, then that actually helps solve some of the commitment problem that Otmar was talking about here because you then create an interest group. But I think that also is the, is the fine line here. Industrial policy has the same challenge, Petra, as you just suggested, that you create a subsidy for a, an industrial group that wants to go invest in some new technology, and then it's hard to remove the subsidy. And so the, the idea that industrial policy and regulations and bans and so on are a key element of a serious response on deep decarbonization is not a license then to do them in a reckless way and not set them up so that they don't have sunset clauses and a variety of other things so that you can continue to keep the resources of the state, places where firms are allowed to collaborate and so on, keep, continue to keep those resources targeted on the places that are really advancing the technological frontier. Danny, you want to add something? 
just that, again, I think this capacity question is at the center of it. To give you an example of what's going on in California, we have very high gasoline prices. It's a very politically sensitive issue, and different parts of the government are trying to figure out how to refund money back to people. There's competing positions. The elements of the legislature have said, let's send refunds to people who file taxes. And the governor's office has said, let's send refunds to people who have car registrations. Mm -hmm. Why are we talking at such strange ways of rebating money? We don't actually have a simple pre-existing mechanism to send money back to people. So if you send it back to people who file taxes, you may not be getting all of the people who aren't citizens, who are paying for higher costs, but haven't filed because of our extraordinarily complex tax system with the state tax regulator. You're going to pick up more of those uh, underprivileged and lower income households if you do it through car registration, but now you're subsidizing car ownership. And all of these complex debates are playing out right now, and there's no simple resolution precisely because we don't even here in California have a way of reaching all of the people who live here with the financial I thought prisons were pretty used to sending us checks to people. <laughs> Even even the, the the transfers that you've seen in, in during the COVID era, for example, took mm -hmm. forever to get to many households. The, the capacity to reach people is a key barrier to this issue. So just, I'm flagging that because that's true in many, many places, including in very wealthy and relative, relatively well-resourced governments. It's, it's, it's an interesting part of the debate that apparently um, institutions are not yet uh, used to giving, handing out money to people. In Germany, we have the debate just the other way around, where we debate whether they're handing out too much money and not well targeted. But Austria has resolved the problem. Um, I would you like to add no, no. that that's remarkable, right? So it's uh, okay. But um, yeah, uh, one issue I would like to to, to highlight here, and, and this is something because we 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 discussed the whole the whole issue a little bit, so to say, about jurisdictions. But uh, so the. We are not living in in a in a world where basically we can only analyze the, the 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 EU or even Germany. And I would like to highlight this on one important issue. So what we have seen over the last three months is the sharp increase of the gas price, and the gas price has a much higher growth rate than the coal price. And this brought coal back around the globe in Asia, but also in Europe. And 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 without a, a uh, so we are lucky to a certain extent in Europe that we have the emissions trading scheme because when the gas price is increasing and coal becomes competitive in the system, so then the CO2 price is also increasing and, and, and pushes uh, coal out of, of, of the system, at least in, in a way which basically is consistent with, 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 with the cap. Therefore, it's such a threat when the EU commission now thinks to, to sell permits because this sends the, the completely wrong signal uh, to the market. But one thing here I would like to highlight, and this is my example, is why it is so important to have a system which can deal with the international price fluctuations on the resource markets. And what we see now is that with gas price and, and the coal price, this is an incredibly important thing. And such relative price changes, such abrupt and, and, and all, almost uh, uh, instantaneous uh, price changes, This is something which, which any kind of climate and energy policy has to deal with. And therefore, I think um, uh, designing mechanisms, which, which basically are quite robust, uh, um, it's, it's very wise. And, and I think uh, in the current situation, the ETS-1 at least helps us uh, to stick to the, 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 to the, Europe, yeah, yeah, the European emissions trading scheme. Okay, maybe I can ask you one question that Mario Hüttenhofer himself um, calls a, a demonic question. Shouldn't we focus much more on on, um, on taxing all gas coal companies at the well and making pressure to force our energy producers and states instead of starting the whole thing from the demand side? What do you think? In an ideal world, uh, an upstream system is much better than a downstream system. Uh, I, I, I would agree, but but this is something which is uh, which which basically the ETS 2 in in Europe is a is a, a an upstream system, almost an upstream system, and I think we should push for an upstream system. Yes. Yeah, I mean, th th this is partly this is an old administrative question. Um, the up a pure upstream system where we would be actually taxing it in Saudi Arabia and so on is something that, that has been fun to talk about and is irrelevant to the real world. 
And so de facto what's happening is we have a bunch of systems that are downstream in the sense that they are being applied in the jurisdictions that have the greatest willingness to do something about emissions right now. Um, and that tend to be importers, not only importers, look at my country. Uh, and then, then they're de facto implemented in a way that makes them as upstream as possible just for reasons of administrative efficiency. But, but the interesting thing is because you made a very funny uh, remark. So taxing Saudi Arabia, I'm of course, I'm not saying we should tax Saudi Arabia, but I think what we should do in Europe is we should tax imports from, from, from gas and oil. And we should tax in particular Russian gas and oil uh, because this is, this is taxing rents away. And this is extremely important. Taxing rents away is something where we can do something good to, to, to limit the revenues for, for Putin, but at the same time to signal the market that, that basically we want to become independent. And the second ETS system, the second uh, emission saving scheme in Europe, would basically form a, a kind of a demand cartel of Europe on that market. And therefore, it is a tragedy. For me, it is a tragedy that the European Parliament has basically rejected the system. So probably they, they, they promise in, the, in two weeks we will come up with a, with a different proposal. But this is something which is, which is enormously important to understand. An emission trading scheme, at least in Europe, or, or, or even a, a tax system, has also some sort of geopolitical implications where we would reduce resource rents from autocratic regimes. Mm -hmm. And this is something which we should also contemplate a little bit more. And, and, and this has a benefit uh, for the consumers in Europe because we become more independent. Mm -hmm. And this also generates revenues from rents which, which, which from an efficiency point of view are quite, it's a quite favorable thing to do. Yeah, and let me just say, I am mindful of the time, I think a demand cartel is overdue and in particular on the gas side, there's no way to really deal with the dependence on the Russian supply without forming in effect a gas buyers yeah. union or a cartel or something like that. I will say there's an area of disagreement, probably a disagreement here um, around this issue of selling the emission credits to, to you know, lower prices and so on. I think from Danny and I see this as, part of the central banker functions that it's not ideal but the i think the larger political point you made otmar that that if there's if there's a huge political blowback because of high natural gas and other energy prices and people associate that you know rightly or wrongly with climate and other kinds of policies then that will set back the whole effort for generation and so i don't frankly begrudge governments that are trying to manage that within the zone of what they think is politically feasible, knowing that the political feasibility is going to be dynamic. But we really have to be careful that we don't overreach here, um, uh, it, it, especially as this really could erode social fabric. So we are short on, on, on time. Uh, I think time is run, running out. Just one, one very brief um, question at, at the end. If I listen to your debate, I, I, I feel it's, it's highly educated. Do you feel that it resonates today more in, in political circles or less? Do you feel better understood than 10 years ago? Or do you have the feeling that it's just politicians are moving away from, from these kind of, of questions and debates? I think they're in the middle of these questions and debates because they're doing stuff. Okay. And you have you have more familiarity with that in Europe because you're doing more stuff. But we're now starting. And so, I mean, I, do I feel perfectly understood by politicians? No. But do I feel like <laughs> they're pursuing these questions with greater vigor than, than they were five years ago or 10 years ago? Absolutely. Danny? I think that's right. Um, and I think in, in the United States, we have a particularly strange situation, which is that our state level action or subnational action is working off of a 20 year old political playbook because the, the institutions that got put in place are very similar to the policy strategies Europe put in place, but without a lot of the administrative capacity. So we are playing catch up to these conversations and I, I hear this debate and, and the contours of it echoed very loudly uh, in the places where I work. Um, so I, I, I would agree with David's sentiment as well. Fatma? I would say uh, politicians are much more um, open to, to such a debate, but economists uh, have to change and they change because uh, so carbon pricing is not an issue for a kind of a, a, a kind of theology, right? So it's it's not about dogmatics. It's it's about in the end, it's about empirics. And what we are doing now is we we, we carrying out a large scale post analysis under what conditions carbon pricing have worked and what we can learn from the design 
uh, for the carbon pricing. So, in in and and what are the, the the preconditions? What is what are the limits of of the recommendations? I think that's uh, that's a, a very good a very good conversation. And uh, so, still a lot of disagreement remains with with Danny and David. But but still, I think uh, we at least we are on, on on the same side when we when we say we want to have good policy and good politics. So this is something which we which we would like. And, and the worst thing is if you have a good policy and you have bad politics or you have bad politics and bad policy. So I, I think that's uh, that's something which we which, which, which is worthwhile to do. And, and uh, this is a much more enlightened uh, uh, debate than we had probably 10 years ago. Okay, thanks to you. I think the forensic part of the issue, uh, we will kind of have hopefully another debate, but now I just hand over to, to Jörg, um, who is going to say some final words. The floor is yours, Jörg. Yeah, first of all, I really would like to thank, um, uh, you know, the whole, all panelists for this absolutely fascinating debate. Um, I really learned a lot and I will definitely uh, hear it again on, on um, you know, the recording. The recording will be on YouTube. It will be available both in English and in German. So uh, for all the audiences who also, like me, want to hear the whole thing uh, once more, just to capture all the nuances, uh, just go to the Bird channel on YouTube. Um, I'm absolutely... Um, really uh, fascinated and, and uh, in agreement with Otmar's um, statement that this is about empirics and not theology. <laughs> I think it is, it is absolutely vital that we get this, um, that we get this right, you know, I mean, well, it's about 1.5 to 2 or whatever we need to, <laughs> we need to get this right. It's absolutely vital. And this instrumental uh, debate about the instruments. And I think that was uh, the start of our, of our conversation. I actually uh, I'm also already ordered the next book of, of David uh, together with uh, Charles Sable um, about uh, fixing the climate. I think I will put it in the chat somewhere. Um, uh, it's not yet out there, but it will be out there. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to reading it over the summer. I'm curious uh, to hear more um, because, you know, Maybe we are more advanced in, in Europe in terms of actually implementing climate policy. We still can, uh, can learn a lot uh, also from um, other people, smart people who are thinking about this stuff. And so I'm, I'm obviously always curious uh, about learning new, new uh, things. And uh, maybe David, uh, we can have another seminar, seminar with Charles Sable and maybe again, Otmar, <laughs> to just to, go, uh, to continue the conversation because it's, it's, a, it's a really a fascinating debate. Petra, also thanks to you for uh, an absolutely smart um, you know, way of uh, moderating the debate. And I hope everybody has enjoyed it as much as I did. So thanks all. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So all, all the best. All the best to all of you. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a nice day, David. Bye-bye. Okay. Good to see you. Thanks.